Thank you, Julia. A few generations ago, Ralph Waldo Emerson believed that the religious life was the good life. He believed that you could find the fullness of yourself by choosing how you live. Emerson believed that church was intended to be a home for full living, but church life had gotten stale. He spoke to the graduating class of ministers at Harvard Divinity School, imploring them to freshen things up, please, to breathe new life into old forms. His Divinity School address is somewhat verbose, and it is too flowery for today's ear. So I have shortened it, and I have made the style a bit less flowery. I've made it, I have also made it slightly my own. Any reference to today's political scene was likely added by me, although some problems are times. After giving this address, Emerson was widely denounced and was not invited back for 30 years. Unitarians, though, came to love his message, and it is an important part of our history. Uh, and some of it might still be relevant today. So here we go. A fresh rendition of Ralph Waldo Emerson's Divinity School Address. Buckle up. We live in a glorious world, a buzz with birds and bees and creatures of all kinds. This world so rich and fruitful, so surprising. And when the night comes, the skies open up and we gaze upon the stars feeling like young children on a tiny globe. Our mind expands to contemplate the laws of the universe, the infinite relations. And then our great questions drop into the human level. What am I? What is life? And then a sweet and overpowering beauty appears to us when our hearts open to the notion of virtue. We fall in love with goodness, even as we don't always know what goodness is. We don't always know the right thing to do. And even when we know better, we sometimes don't live up to our own principles. We can see goodness in each other's faces. We can feel goodness even in our own remorse, even as it can be a challenge to articulate what is good. Goodness is the essence of religion, so let us explore goodness. How you behave changes you. This is a law of the soul. If you cheat someone, your soul will feel the effect. If you're mean, your soul will shrink. If you lie to yourself, you lose connection with yourself. But if you put your goodness in your, if you put goodness in your sights and adore goodness and seek to act in harmony with goodness, you will become goodness itself. How you behave changes you. You might not notice it right away, and sometimes circumstances or bad luck can get in the way, but it is how the universe moves. If you seek to live in harmony with virtue, you will find other virtuous people. Like attracts like, and love grows on love. In the sense, love is a force that acts in the universe. By our act of loving, we find that we have lives full of love. By our act of loving, we find ourselves in a love that is bigger than us. By loving the universe, we say to the universe, you become love. The story of the universe is a story of waking up to love. And we are part of the story just as every star, every ray of sunshine, every wavelet in a pond is part of the story. When you live in harmony with love, perhaps you can feel a strength that is bigger than you. When you live in harmony with love, perhaps you feel that the whole world, the whole universe is on your side. 
And when you lose connection with love, perhaps you feel cold, empty, and shrunken down. Childish people believe in becoming great. You hear it in the slogan, make America great again. Greatness might make you feel secure, but it makes you small. Childish people believe in becoming great, while mature people believe in becoming good. Goodness brings with it the greatness of the divine. You feel its deep melodies wander into your soul, and then you can worship and be enlarged by worship. The act of reverence has blossomed in many places in human history. It never dies out. Ancient words still feel fresh when they are reverent, even if written in an old style. The divine shines through. The doors of the temple are wide open day and night, and the oracles of truth never cease. But love cannot be received as a lesson. Love is discovered as a feeling, an intuition, not a pronouncement. I cannot take it on faith that love is good. I must feel it. And there are times when I don't feel it. I don't feel the love within myself and I cease to know that there is a larger love. Netflix and chill becomes the full extent of my being. I become a conduit for clickbait headlines and photos of cats. Now there's nothing wrong with photos of cats when they are connected to a larger love. But when cuteness is the extent of your value system, you become small. A partial awareness of love might make me believe that only some people have a full awareness of love. You go to so-called holy people to feel their expansiveness rather than realizing that you can feel the expansiveness of love yourself. Missing out on the fullness of love happens not only in our individual lives, it also happens in organized religion. Now I am speaking to all of you as our next generation of ministers. I have no doubt that you can speak the message of love. Today, I would like to draw your attention to the shortcomings of organized religion as practiced today. So we'll take Christianity, for example. I will point out two errors and how Christianity is often practiced. Some say that Jesus was the perfect person, overflowing with love, able to win the heart of the meanest tax collector, able even to forgive the ignorance of his executioner. What a guy. Well worth learning from, well worth emulating. And it is well worth getting yourself caught up in the larger love that he was in. But what a distortion of his message we find in some of his followers. They will damn you if you say that Jesus was just a human. People worship his language, his tropes, not his message. He said that there are ways that we should live our lives. There are commandments that we should follow but most important is love. Love comes first. Relationship comes before judgment. Relationship first. Jesus loved people so much that he would be with them before judging them. Christianity, as is often practiced, has fallen into an error common in many religions, putting the messenger before the message. So that's the first error that I would like to draw your attention to. When you feel the larger love, there is no one person at the heart of it. The larger love is bigger than any person. It is bigger than any ritual. It is bigger than any doctrine. Jesus taught to be truthful, but little kids get in trouble for saying what they truly believe if their belief isn't aligned with doctrine. 
that is best, which helps me to connect with myself. The divine poets seek out my virtue, my intellect, my strength. They invite me to bring myself into the channel of universal love. They provoke me to resist my unhealthy habits, to fill the world with love, to be with a capital B. It is profane to think that you can win people over to love by telling stories of miracles. Instead, invite people into the gift of love. The gift of love is not boastful, overpowering, exclusive. The gift of love is sweet, natural goodness, a goodness like yours and mine that invites yours and mine to grow. The second defect in doing church is a consequence of the first. Churches too often look to the distant past for inspiration, as if universal truths were revealed then and no more. This sucks the air out of the speaker's lungs. A preacher needs to be filled with the beauty of a larger love. The preacher needs to be enamored with the divine, not just reading about it as if something that, as something that was experienced by someone else long ago. Have speakers who are moved by courage, devotion, love, wisdom. And we can all be like that. Don't say what is trendy. Don't try to be interesting. Let your heart say what needs saying. Too often, there is no soul in sermons. Your devoted neighbor stays home because it seems that home is a holier place than church. And how many churches are you made to feel that you're part of a larger love? This one, I think. At my grandmother's funeral, the minister said all of the usual things, but he gave no indication that he had ever laughed, ever cried, never been commended or cheated or chagrined. If he had ever lived and acted, we were none the wiser. The main secret of his profession to turn life into truth, he had not learned. This man had worked, had talked, had read, had eaten and drunken, his head aches, his heart throbs, he smiles, he suffers, yet there was not a hint in this sermon that he had ever lived. Not a line did he draw out of real history. The true preacher can be known by this, that she shares life, life passed through the fire of thought. But of the bad preacher, it could not be told from his sermon what age of the world he lived in, whether he had a parent or a child, or any other fact of his life. It seems strange that the people should come to listen to this thoughtless clamor. Yes, a bad preacher can still have something to offer. If you read between the lines and illustrate the lessons yourself while you listen with images from your own life, you can still find life amidst the words. A prayer, though foolishly spoken, can be wisely heard. When I speak of bad preachers, I am not saying that they are bad people. They have a purity and a strict conscience that is good, but merely partial, that is missing the whole, that is missing soul. And without knowing soul, people settle for the usual, the superficial, or merely the interesting. They let themselves shrink. Public worship no longer has a hold on people. Church life is no longer alluring, life-giving. What a loss to society when there is no worship, when there is no sense that we are part of a larger love. And that happens, all things decay. Genius leaves the temple. Literature becomes frivolous. Science is cold. The eye of youth is not lighted by hope. And age is without honor. All we are left with is cat videos. And so you might ask in these empty days, what is to be done? 
how can we expand beyond cute cat videos into something more? Well, the answer has already been given. We have contrasted the church with the soul. We need to choose soul. We need to show up, each of us, as a real person. In personhood is revolution. In personhood, all is made transparent and whole. It is the role of a true teacher to show that love is revealed to us now, not that it was revealed in the past. One soul is more powerful than any nation because nations rise and fall and are forgotten while encountering one soul changes us forever. If you take your knowledge of love secondhand from ancient texts or from romance movies on Netflix, if you take your knowledge of love secondhand, you get wide of love and the chasm grows to the point where you forget that there's anything divine in you. So dare to love love directly. Don't strive to imitate the Buddha's love or Ralph Waldo Emerson's love. Connect with your own love. Go for the real thing. Go beyond what is popular, what is powerful, what is habitual, and live with the experience of the immeasurable mind. You will encounter people who are not feeling connected to the larger love. Just be yourself with them. Let your thoughtfulness and your virtue come through. Let their trampled instincts find that they can emerge in your company. Let their timid aspirations find in you a friend. Let their doubts know that you have doubted. Let their life force know that you have lived. Everybody has the capacity for the sublime, the holy. Everyone can discover the value of the life well lived. Don't settle for society's praises. The bar is too low. Aim not for the prestige of a finite world. Have high and universal aims. When you meet someone who has achieved success in this world, they will notice that you have achieved something more. They might even feel the invitation to join you. And what shall we do to breathe life back into the church? We cannot build a new church from scratch. Love creates its own forms. So let's breathe new life into the space for new forms to emerge. In particular, let's do two things. Let's have time every week that we experience as holy. Regardless of the pains and challenges of life, holy time renews us. Holy time helps us to see how we are all the same and we are all part of something magnificent. And let us tell each other the truth. Honest sharing makes us both drop into the fullness of ourselves. Let us layer that truth with encouragement and love so that we might each find new hope and new understanding. I look forward to the time when ultimate goodness, which shows up in ancient texts, shows up fully among us. May we see for ourselves that love and goodness are one thing that also includes understanding and beauty and joy. <laughs>